fix it if I need to. Okay. I'll actually turn it off. I was going to, but you can certainly go ahead and take it now. Um, are you returning to school, or is it for your child? Okay, so you won't need that one. This one I would take. This one I would take. Um, are you or anyone else a member of, um, or a veteran? Okay, okay, all right. And is this for you or My your, daughter. your daughter? Okay, so you're not going to need that one.
Well, welcome everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, good. So first question, does everyone have this? Did I miss anyone? Looks familiar. And if, if at the end you want additional copies, you go right ahead and we have some. Need one? There you go. Okay. So we'll get a couple of things out of the way here. First of all, thank you for spending a little bit of time with us this evening um, to check out our school and to uh, talk a little bit about financial aid and, and ways of paying for college. Um, I've shared with you some really, I think, helpful documents provided by the um, Department of Education. We're going to get into that in a little bit. So one of the first things I wanted to talk about was tuition okay before we get into how you're going to pay for all this stuff what are we actually talking about paying what what's all incurred in going to college one of the first things I'd like to mention is the tuition itself so tuition here is about hundred and fifty dollars <coughs> per credit we do have some um, programs that are more than that obviously like our aeronautics program but in general it's about hundred and fifty per credit some of the basic things obviously we accept cash check money order, all that good stuff. But also, um, we do third party contracts with different employers. Um, if you're an adult student coming back, we have um, third party contracts we do with them. The, the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, WIOA funding. So there's other agencies out in the community that do cover tuition charges and such. We also offer a payment plan. We normally split that into between three and five monthly payments for the tuition. Um, there is a, a small fee that goes along with that, but that way you can split your tuition over the semester. It's not all due right up front. So that's kind of the, the basics of the tuition amounts, um, the, the other types of payments other than financial aid options. Um, I also wanted to mention the veteran education benefits. I think I asked that question up in the, in the beginning if anyone in your household was a veteran because there are funding options there. We do also have um, a whole separate table just for veteran benefits just down the hall. We do have a Veterans Resource Center so I definitely would encourage you to stop in there <coughs> if you do um, have a veteran in the household. There's some great um, education benefits. So with that, I think most of you wanted to spend some time talking about financial aid. That's going to be the main um, amount of time that we spend today talking about financial aid. So one of the main things um, that I'd like to mention, that document, the trifold document, is probably a really, really good resource for you. We're not going to go through that verbatim, obviously, but it's something I would definitely encourage you to take a look at. Um, one of the main things to talk about here at Fox Valley Tech, it's critical that you're admitted, that the student is admitted to a financial aid eligible program. So our associate degree programs are financially eligible. Technical diplomas are eligible. Most of the certificate level programs are not. So I just want to throw that out there in the beginning so everyone understands that it does depend on the program that you're admitted to whether you're eligible or not. With that, um, I wanted to also then talk about, you know, we talked about the tuition in the beginning, the $150 per credit on average. There are other costs associated with going to college, obviously. It's not just that tuition. There's also book expenses, right? So those are the two obvious direct expenses, tuition and books. Um, but then there's the indirect expenses, such as transportation, um, personal expenses, and room and board. So that also, please keep in mind, um, is all going to be something that you're going to be incur incurring while you're, while you're attending school. So, how are we gonna how are we gonna pay for those things and in the end we're gonna go through some examples and tie all of this together um, so cost of attendance how are we gonna pay for that first thing I would encourage you to do is complete the FAFSA right and that's um, documented in that Department of Ed um, trifold document that I provided that's what we're gonna spend some time with now so the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid and I really want to um, draw out that first F free. It is free. You do not have to pay to apply for the FAFSA for any other federal funding. Um, it's the FAFSA.gov website, G-O-V, FAFSA.gov. It's critical that that's the one that you use. It is on that document. Um, there are scams. You've probably heard in the news. There are scams out there um, directing you to a wrong website or a website where you'd have to pay to apply for the FAFSA. 
You do not need to do that. If you have questions, you can contact FAFSA. Um, there's a phone number, there's a website, there's online chat as you're doing this process. And you certainly can contact our school. We help people do the FAFSA every single day. So again, it is free. Please be careful where you're going. It's FAFSA.gov. Um, the FAFSA is available October 1st of every year. So just this past Sunday, October 1st, the FAFSA became available for this upcoming, this fall, uh, this upcoming fall term, so the fall of 2018. That FAFSA has become available. You could start doing it right now. Um, we actually are having an event tom uh, tomorrow evening to start doing the FAFSA um, for the 2018-19 school year. We're having an event tomorrow from 6 to 8 in the evening. Um, we'll help people complete it from beginning to end. Okay? And I'll remind you of that again in the, in the end. So the FAFSA, like I mentioned, for the 18-19 school year is for the fall of 2018, spring of 2019, and summer of 2019. I'm thinking that's what a lot of you are probably interested in, potentially this upcoming fall school year. Um, let's see. Along with the FAFSA, at the end of the process, and we're going to go through this process in just a minute, but at the end when you actually submit it electronically, you need to create an FSA ID. It's the Federal Student Aid ID. That, it's, a very, it's the Department of Ed's way of securing your information, ensuring that what you're putting in there um, and you're attesting to is really about you. We'll spend a little more time in the end talking about that. But I just want you to know the FAFSA and the FSA ID go hand in hand. And that is referenced on this. Hopefully everyone got this. So this talks about the, F, um, the FAFSA itself, what to do, when to do it, what to bring, and all that good stuff. On the back side is the FSA ID. It's a six-step process to create the FSA ID. Um, and it needs to be done for the student and the parent. If, like, if we have some recent high school graduates or soon-to-be high school graduates, the parent is also going to need to have an FSA ID created as well. And it's a nice um, little chart there um, that tells you the six steps that are needed to, to create that. Okay? So again, um, we help people every single day do the FAFSA and create that FSA ID. Um, let's see. So you're going to work on the FAFSA. It's going to ask for biographic and demographic information for the student and for the parent, potentially. Um, it's going to look at income and asset information for the student and the parent. Okay? It's also going to ask for the number in family, the number in that household, the number of people in that household that are going to college. All of those um, types of questions are asked on the FAFSA. Then the Department of Education takes all that information and runs it to, through some algorithms and produces a number at the end. It's an indicator. It's called the EFC. It's the Expected Family Contribution. And they do talk about it um, in that trifold document. That EFC is basically the indicator, the financial need indicator for the family. Okay? It can be as little as zero and go up into the thousands. It's not necessarily the dollar amount that you as a family need to contribute to schooling but it is a financial indicator, the financial need of the family, okay? So then we, as the financial aid administrators, we take that number and then that's how we determine what types of funding you may be eligible for, okay? So just to kind of reiterate here, the FAFSA, normally done online, information for the student and the, and the parent, potentially, income and asset information, and in, basically information about the household. That is processed by the Department of Ed. They provide this EFC number that then gets shared with the colleges that you're interested in attending. So once we receive it, we as the, the financial aid administrator, we take that EFC number and we, we try to determine, okay, you're in a financial aid eligible program, your EFC is let's say zero, we're gonna try and put together a package of different types of aid to cover your needs of going to college. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, so in the beginning, we talked about the different pieces of attending college, the direct and indirect costs, the tuition books, room and board, transportation, personal expenses. That's considered the cost of attendance. Okay, So in an example, let's just say it's $10,000. OK? 
pay $10,000 for the entire year to cover all those five components of school. And let's say for the family, the EFC is zero, indicating that it's a relatively you know, financially needy family. So there, the federal government has an expectation that that family will be contributing zero to the, the educational expenses, okay? So we're gonna have $10,000 of, of costs that we're, we're gonna be looking at covering through different types of financial aid. So I wanted to just talk about the different types of aid that are available. So when you do that FAFSA, that's the application really for federal grants, federal loans, and the federal work study program, in addition to Wisconsin grants, okay? So those are the main components, grants, loans, and work study. Those are the three types of funding to cover those five different types of costs, okay? So in that example, the $10,000, the zero EFC, we're coming up, trying to come up with a $10,000 financial aid package. Um, hopefully we can get a, a Pell Grant for the family. Um, on average, well I shouldn't say average, the maximum amount for a Pell Grant um, this upcoming year is approximately $6,000. So I'm just kind of throwing out there some numbers um, just so you have some perspective on the different types of funding and the amounts involved. So the Pell Grant for a financially needy family would be up to $6,000. Federal loans, um, you've probably heard of the subsidized Stafford loan and unsubsidized Stafford loan. Those are the, the common federal loans that we work with here. Depending on um, the students, you know, if the student is a first year student here or a third year student or whatever the case may be. If they're a dependent student under the age of 24, basically a new high school graduate coming or if they're a returning student, you know, coming into the out of the workforce and coming back to school, the, the amounts that they're eligible for can vary, but in general it would be around 5,500 and up to 10,500 in a given year. Okay, so again, 6, 000, up to 6,000 for Pell, up to 10,500 for loans. Um, the work study here at our school, um, it goes up to about $4,800 for the year, split amongst two different terms. Um, and again, that is dependent on the financial need of the family. So that's all going to depend on that EFC that's provided after you do the FAFSA. So some people are not going to be eligible for Pell Grant. Some people are not going to be eligible for work study. We don't know that until you do the FAFSA and we get that EFC. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, there are... Uh, like especially for the, maybe the higher cost programs like maybe our aeronautic program, there are additional funding options like if the Pell work study loans aren't enough for some reason, there are other options. There's a PLUS loan, that's the parent loan for undergraduate students. That's above and beyond doing the FAFSA. There's not a lot of additional steps, but that is an option, the PLUS loan. Um, that is in the name of the parent, not in the student. So the other loans I talked about, the Stafford loan, the sub and on-sub Stafford loans, those are in the name of the student. The student would be paying that back, whereas the PLUS loan is for the, the, in the parent's name. Um, just to throw this out you, at you too, the, the current rate, I believe, for the, the PLUS loan is 7%. The unsub, I think, is for 4.45% uh, for both sub and unsub loans, just to kind of throw that out there as well so you have some perspective. Um, if PLUS loans are not an option or not um, enough, there are also private loans. You can certainly go to your, your banking institution, um, credit union, whatever the case may be, and apply for private loans as well. Not that we're encouraging that by any means. I'm just trying to throw all the options out there for you. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Certainly, I want you to know that we're my office and I are, are here to help. If you have questions, if you want to complete the FAFSA, we're open Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Fridays 8 to 4. Uh, we help people complete the FAFSA every single day from beginning to end. We help them create the FSA ID if needed. Um, so never feel that you're totally alone. Um, if you're at home doing it, you can certainly call us. I have our cards up here as well. Um, we're definitely here to help. One of the other things I like to just mention is that just don't ever assume that you make too much money, you're not gonna be eligible for any type of aid. But also don't assume that you're, you're too poor and that, pe that college is not an option. That really is not the case. We try to ensure that we can get, um, get folks every penny that they're 
um, eligible and entitled to, that's really one of the things that we focus on. We don't want people to miss out on money that, that could help them get their degree. So um, I did also want to say that I'll stick around as long as necessary. I think that there's some other presentation in here after this, but we can talk on the side or, or whatever the case may be. Um, I know it's sometimes difficult to ask a question, you know, sometimes a personal or financial question in a big group like this, but you know, we can talk as long as necessary and um, go through whatever your questions are. So with that, are there any, any general questions that you have right now? So the FSA ID that you as the parent create, that will stick with you forever and for every child that you end up doing it for. So it's important that you keep that same FSA ID. So you're going to have one ID for yourself, and each of your kids will have their own FSA ID. And do you recommend when we do our FAFSA, um, currently, should we do the ID? Uh, it doesn't really matter. I would always, and I, it does prompt you. I mean, you can't complete it really without it, um, unless you want to go through some paper signature page, which you really don't want to do. Yes. Yes. Yep. So I would encourage, I mean, you could all go home today. If you don't have an FSA ID and you have nothing else to do tonight, go out and create it. It doesn't really take very long. It's done. It's out of the way. Um, you know, you can do it in, in five minutes or less, really. It's not a, a horribly time-consuming thing. But as long as we have a couple minutes and there were no other questions, I'd like to just talk a little bit more about the FSA ID. It is important, and again, this is all for security purposes, right, that you're signing the, the FAFSA. Um, it's important that the parent create the parent FSA ID and the student create the student FSA ID. A lot of times we'll have mom that created the FSA ID for the mom and for the student. And then it comes down the road the next year. The student doesn't know what the FSA ID is. They don't know how the mom created it. They don't know what, you know, security questions are out there and all those other things. So it gets, you know, that gets to be a little time consuming to get that FSA ID reset. Um, so I would really encourage you and, you know, it's getting the child involved in the whole process as well. Um, having the, the student create the FSA ID for themselves. It's bio demo information, social security number, um, address, all that kind of good stuff. But then it also asks for security questions like, you know, what, what city were you born in or what's your first car, whatever that, that the case may be. So if you have the wrong person creating it, the, the, the other person is not going to know how to reset, reset it and it gets pretty ugly at that point. But in general, it's, you know, as long as the right person's doing it, it really is not that bad of a process and that will stick with you forever. Any other questions? Yep. Um, for the scholarships that you might offer, is that like a one-time fill out the form thing? Yep. It's, out or is it individual yep, it's a one-time application basically each year. Um, and there is a table right down the hall um, that they're doing, you know, that they're focused only on scholarships. That's exactly what they do. Um, I do have a little bit of information. So for high school seniors, I know we've got kind of a mixed crowd here. We've got high school seniors and, and some adults returning to, to higher education. But for high school seniors, we've got over 65 scholarships available. Um, the application is open now, basically from now until March of 2018. They range from about 500 to $1,000. Um, again, one easy application and some of them are program related, some of them are based on financial need, some of them are based on academic performance, you know, volunteerism, things like that. So again, don't assume that, you know, make too much money, I'm not going to get this scholarship. That's not the case. It definitely, it, it pays to apply. And again, it is one easy application and then you're kind of in the running for over 60 scholarships. So then we also have one for currently enrolled students. Um, I don't know that that really applies to folks here, but we do, you know, so let's say you, you come and you're, you're going to come, you know, year after year for two years at least to finish your program. Um, those scholarships range from $500 to $2,000 per semester, um, and there's over 350 of those types of scholarships awarded each year. So 
there's there it really is a lot available. Any other um, I think it's at March 18th, or March, March 2nd of 2018. So it is open now, October, right now, through March 2nd. And I would also mention about um, the completing the FAFSA. I would, not that you have to go out and do it today or anything like that, but the sooner you do it, the better. Um, the earlier um, application date, the earlier FAFSA application date, um, you're going to be in the running for some of the state funding, the Wisconsin grant that I mentioned before. That is based on, that's really one of the main things that's um, based on application date, so FAFSA date, and financial need. So as, just as an example, somebody that has a zero EFC, that expected family contribution, um, financially needy family has a zero EFC, and they apply, they have a FAFSA date of today, they could potentially get that Wisconsin grant. The same family that applied, let's say, in July of 2018, they're financially needy, but they're not going to receive that grant because they applied too late. That funding source is gone. There's only a certain bucket of the Wisconsin grant money, and that goes to the people that applied first and had the financial need for it. Most other things, though, the, uh, the FAFSA um, application for grants, loans, and work study, um, at least the grants and loans, that that is not based on your application date necessarily. It's not like, you know, you. You were eligible for the Pell Grant if you applied on October 1st, but now you're not if you apply next August. That's not the case. You'd still be eligible. That funding bucket does not go away. Um, yep, good question. If, if everybody didn't care, the question is when you get the award letter. So if you complete the FAFSA, let's say this week in, in October, we aren't going to be pulling that information in from the Department of Ed until probably December of this year or even January of next year, then we have to run through our processes, make sure everything is all nice and tidy, um, admitted to a program, that type of thing, and then we would be sub, um, supplying the award letter. So I would say mid to late winter, somewhere in that range. And we would send a paper letter, but also, you know, once you're admitted to the college, you're going to have a, a student ID, you're going to have a MyFBTC account, we call it. It's basically our kind of our online student system. That's where um, you can view grades, you can view your balance, you can view your financial aid award. So it would also be out there too, in addition to the paper letter. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So when you fill out the application, they ask you to list the college. Mm -hmm. If you list more than one college, then is each college going to be an award letter when they're... Potentially, yes. Okay. So the question was, if you, when you complete the FAFSA, you need to put a school code on there. Okay, the school code is, a, I believe, a six-digit number that, how much time do I, yeah. Um, it's a six-digit number, and that identifies to the Department of Ed where, where does this student want their financial aid information to go. You can put up to 10 school codes on the FAFSA. Um, I think you can actually put in more if, ne if necessary, but 10 school codes. The, the Department of Ed then will send, push that information out to those 10 schools. Um, and then every school seems to have a little bit different timeline. Ours, like I mentioned, was December, January when we pull it in. And then within a couple of months after that, you would get the, the, the award letter. So every school is going to be a little bit different, but you would get an award letter from each school at some point if you followed through and did the application to the college and all that. One other thing I'd like to just mention is that you do need to do the FAFSA every year. So if you go ahead and do it this week, you're going to have to do it every single year that uh, the student is going to college. It is a yearly thing. It's based on tax information. So remember when I said you need income and asset information for the student and the parent? It's based on tax information or income information from two years prior. Okay? Um, and it's going to walk you through that. When you do the FAFSA process, it's going to walk you through all of that. But when you're doing the 18-19 FAFSA for this upcoming year, you're going to want tax information from 2016, okay? So hopefully everybody's got that all done. The 2016 taxes should have been, you know, done and over by now, hopefully. So um, that, uh, that's what you need two years prior. So the question was, um, are you going to basically are you going to receive an award letter 
um, from every school that you put on the FAFSA, whether you were admitted or not. I think that sums up the question. Um, it really does depend on the college. Um, there was a time where we would not, um, so somebody could have uh, supplied a FAFSA to us, but never bothered applying to the college. They just decided they were going to go somewhere else, but they just, you know, they didn't notify us. They just didn't, they just decided not to ever even apply. We would never, at the time, we would never have awarded that student. We have, would have not sent them an award letter because to us it was an indicator that they weren't, they weren't taking the step to be admitted to our college. But every school is different, so I wouldn't assume that. That's a good question. Uh, it's about the Wisconsin grant, and is it for just Wisconsin schools, no matter where they're from, or is it for um, Wisconsin residents, no matter what school they decide to go to, kind of one or the other? Um, it's a really good question. It's my understanding that it's Wisconsin residents, so your residency is in Wisconsin, and you're for sure attending a Wisconsin school. I, that's a really good question. Um, I can find that answer for you if you can stick around for a minute. Good question. Can you add? Yes, yep. So you can, um, question was, can you add additional schools? Um, you can certainly, if you've already done the FAFSA, got that out of the way, you can go back in, um, and they call it making a correction, basically going back into your FAFSA and just inserting a row for an additional school code. You can definitely do that really at any time. We've got about five minutes before the next one starts. Any, yes? Do you know a general, like, yeah, I always get that question. It's a great question. Um, the question is about um, an income range for getting a grant, basically the Pell Grant. Um, it really, it varies so much based on number of people in the household, number of people going to college, those types of criteria that the feds use in their little algorithm. I would say that it, it does follow the um, poverty guidelines. So, you know, if you're falling into somewhere in that range, the 100 to 150% range or something for, for that family size, um, I would say that you would not be guaranteed, but I mean, you're going to be in that range of receiving the Pell Grant. Kind of as an indicator, I guess. Free and reduced lunch also. So we've got a lot of high school students in here. If any of you qualified for free and reduced lunch, that's also a pretty good indicator that you would be Pell Grant eligible. Any other questions? Yes. If it's, um, so the question was, if it's, um, if we're talking about assets, um, does that get included on the FAFSA? Um, if it's your main house of res residence, that does not get included as an asset. Right. Now a second home would. Investments, um, stocks, bonds, all that kind of good stuff, that would be included. And one of the nice things about doing the FAFSA online, as you're going into each of those fields online, um, there's a little pop-up in the upper right-hand corner, I believe, that kind of gives you a definition of what, what, it, what are they looking for. So if we had more time, we could talk about all that fun stuff. There's all kinds of things to talk about with the FAFSA, but great question. Oh, yikes. Any other questions? Okay. And again, I'll stay on the side if anybody does have more personal questions, okay? Thank you.
take it that you just turn those off. So now you could be one of the uh, girls people to come in. Potentially. I'm currently doing a um, girls for poet. Are you? Nice. What time is it? Is it nice? That's cool. What age group? Is mm -hmm. Six to twelve. Grade oh, six, this one is as well attended. It. The one before this was about financial stuff. That's us Perfect. Awesome. Great. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Like spark that interest. Patty and I talk about that all the time. How do we get those middle school kids engaged and understand? Ready. Sure. Mm -hmm. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready, Dory? Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Cute little dog pictures. <laughs> 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 all right. All right, we'll get started have, at, here at 5 o'clock. So this panel is on choosing a college. It's meant to be a real general session, and hopefully all of you will have questions and we can kind of zero in on the things you're interested in hearing more about. But we have five panelists here with us tonight, each of them with a little bit different perspective about how they or someone they know or someone that's related to them made choices about um, choosing a college. So. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists and then we'll come back and we'll let them sort of talk a little bit more about how they're connected with the college. Or actually, I'll let them do it right from the very start. I'll, I'll work my way out of a job here. How about that? So, Tony, if you want to start and, and introduce yourself, your role in the community or your job, and how you're affiliated with the college and kind of why you're here tonight. You bet. So my name is Tony Gonzalez. I'm, I'm the Vice President of Community Development for United Way Fox City. So certainly my role is to be engaged um, with the community in many different ways and, and the staff I work with and volunteers make investment decisions. So we make the decisions on the dollars that are invested back in the community in many programs. I'm also uh, on the Board of Trustees for Fox Valley Technical College. I've been on uh, as a board uh, member since 2013, so I'm in my fourth year um, as a trustee member. Hi, I'm Rita O'Brien. I am the Career and Technical Education Coordinator and Career-Based Learning Coordinator for the Appleton School District. So I'm here today to chat with you maybe mostly about how we prepare our students and show them that there's many multiple pathways to prosperity and how Fox Valley Technical College fits into that as well. Rose. Hi, my name is Rose Guthrie and I'm here as a parent. I had two sons that graduated from here. It's been a few years, but they're both very successful. Um, neither one of them did go on to get their bachelors and um, they are just doing awesome. So I'm here to just talk about that a little bit and answer any questions you might have about that. Now, Rose, you have another connection with the college as well. Yes, um, uh, this is my first semester. I haven't been teaching, but I did teach in the computer science area for 18 years here. Um, and I am just considered semi-retired right now. But I'm in the process of working with um, a lot of younger people to try to get them interested in the technologies and um, staying with all of the uh, women in technology and some of the other groups to try to continue to pursue and helps, helps young students to pursue technology. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Liz? Oh, oh, you got that <laughs> one? Okay, two of them. <laughs> Hi, I am Liz Lefebvre. I work upstairs in the Teaching and Learning Center. Um, I am actually a former graduate of Fox Valley Tech, and um, our oldest daughter is going to school here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. All right. Dory. I'm Dory Railing. I'm a retired teacher from Appleton Area School District. I worked in the high school and um, spent a lot of time talking to students about their next step in their education. So we talked about Fox Valley Tech a lot. I'm also here as a parent. I have three sons. Two went, got their bachelor's degrees. My third son is a graduate here and doing very well. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Patty Jorgensen, Vice President of Student and Community Development here at the college and your moderator for the evening. So. So Tony, uh, your son is currently in school here, so would you share with people uh, kind of how he arrived at the decision to come here, what that whole process of making that decision was like for you and your family, and how Anthony, right, is yes. going, yep, so, uh, and how he's doing now. Yeah, he's, um, 
He's in his second year. He's in the fire science and paramedic program. He'll finish up fire science this year, um, paramedic next year. Um, I, you know, I, he actually started um, an interest in fire science when he was in high school. We got him connected to the Explorers program, um, and it was through my affiliation with uh, the tech college and the board. Um, I was fortunate to have uh, a, certainly the opportunity to tour the public safety building early on and, and learn about the college. Um, so it, for us, it was an easy decision to make, but we did our due diligence. Um, we met with uh, the college. We went through an open house uh, such as this. Uh, we met with instructors to tour the public safety building with my son. Um, wanted to make certain that he felt comfortable with the college, so we did that. Uh, we were able to connect with an instructor to ask instructor here questions about the career. He had a list and we helped him develop a list of questions, um, which I thought was quite helpful um, for his decision, uh, not only in this comfort level of, of this college, but um, with his comfort level in the career, quite frankly. Um, we looked at, because of his interest in fire science and the paramedic program, uh, we learned about a collaboration between the, the Tech College and UW Oshkosh, a uh, firm program, fire emergency response management program, which would allow him to, to complete his education here, get the associate degrees here, and go on for two more years uh, through UW Oshkosh and end up with a bachelor's of science degree. Um, that was a, a, a key factor for us uh, with him in making the decision because we thought it was important for him um, to have that four-year degree as well as a, uh, something to fall back on. Um, so all the pieces for us fit together uh, quite nicely. Um, he also um, in, in coming to the college has very early connected with some friends um, that opened up some doors for him in terms of career opportunities already. He's, he's hired by Grand Shoot Fire um, in a very part-time position. So the proximity of the college here that allowed him to keep his position um, with Grand Shoot was also an easy decision for us to make. So. Tony, just a question, is, is Anthony living at home? Or? He's living at home, and, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that too. I mean, one of the factors for us, quite frankly, um, we set maybe a high aspiration of, of having him get through college without any debt whatsoever. And we came up with a plan with him. He's working, he's actually got a couple of jobs. We've been putting m money away in, in an education IRA for him since he was born, um, honestly. And the decision, um, one of the deciding factors for us was he was able to live at home because, again, of close proximity. We're going to be able to make it happen, actually, for him to get through college without having any debt because of all the things that, all the stars that align for us. Um, the program here, quite frankly, is, is um, one can argue, the best in the nation for him to get the education that he's getting in terms of fire science. The investment we've made as a community in public safety building um, really doesn't compare um, or is challenged to compare to any other facility, quite frankly, in the country. In the country. Internationally, folks um, certainly are taking advantage of that program. So um, it was very easy for us to want to um, have him come here because of the quality of education he's going to get and is getting, quite frankly. Thank you. I also want to invite all of you to ask questions. So this is your chance to get information, and please use our panelists. If you have questions at any time, just raise your hand, and we'll stop, and we'll, um, we'll take your questions. So um, Rita, I'm going to skip you, if you don't mind. OK. We'll stick with the children theme, and then come back to sure. sort of general, if that's all right. <laughs> sure. Yes, please do. Yeah, I, well, I think that's a great question. You know, is he, um, in fact, I still feel that way a little bit. Um, we talked with him about, and part of our decision was, 
So does he have an opportunity to live away from home and do this? Um, I honestly thought that perhaps he would meet some friends and they might consider getting an apartment. That would challenge us in terms of getting the goal of getting him through college without any debt, but I, my wife and I were willing to go that route if that's what he wanted to do and he felt it was the right thing. Um, at the same time, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stumble on the village, uh, village, Tech Village, but we knew that Tech Village was in the works. Again, a benefit of being on the Board of Trustees, saying that there's a possibility that if he wanted to, that might be an option for him to actually live across the street with some um, classmates. It hasn't happened, though he's connected with them. Um, he spent time, in fact, he spent time at their homes as if, some, a couple of them, as if he was living there. So he He's, he's had a good experience, I think, good connection. He's been spending more time away from home than at home. So far, so good for us. Mm -hmm. I'll just mention Tech Village. Um, I was, you know, when it first opened, and that is a privately owned, privately managed um, housing facility that we are affiliated with. So it's all our students over there. We thought from the beginning it would be people from a distance, obviously, that didn't want to drive. Um, it's, there are probably 50% or more local people who want that college experience. So it's there if you have someone that does want it, um, you know, you have the choice. So. The security, so, um, so they have on-site security, so the doors are locked, they have all the cameras. We do use our security interns to patrol the lot um, multiple times in the evening. So we kind of jointly do that. Um, they take care of the plowing. It's all it's all divided out, but um, yeah. So Rose. Okay. All right. Um, I actually have two sons that graduated from here. My first son uh, graduated. Uh, start, found out about the college. Well, from home. Both my husband and I. To be fair, I have to tell you, both my husband and I are teachers here. Like I said, I just retired. My husband is still working um, for a long time. But we made it very clear to our sons that it was not a requirement for them to come here. It was, it's your future. We need to, we want to help you with that and make those decisions. Um, and we want you to be able to decide what's right for you. So um, my oldest one came here with his high school on a bus to check out the, the college when he was a senior. <laughs> And um, they're both technology related because my husband and I are so far into the technology. Um, so he was like, yeah, I think I'll check out the computer science program and see what that is. And um, he's like, okay, great. They have a lot of good stuff. And at the end of the, he t keeps telling me this, at the end of the tour, there was some time left over. So their tour guide said, well, I have one other area I'd like to show you. And it was the automated manufacturing lab, the robotics. And after that, he was sold. He was like, yep, this is exactly what I want to do. So um, he, when he graduated, he came here for the two years and did the automated manufacturing um, program. And at the end of his um, second year, he had been contacted by the Global Studies area to try to sign up for a, um, it was a, a youth exchange. It was a, a scholarship type program. And what ended up happening is he was accepted into it and he actually went to Germany for one year. And again, that was all through here. Um, just kind of to go up back onto that whole college experience, Fox Valley Tech has so many things for the students that are offered, from sports to you know outside activities to the global studies. There's so many opportunities for them to get involved outside of class with other students. And I, we really encouraged our kids to do that, and they did, and they made a lot of really good friends and got involved in a lot of really good things outside of school that were not school related. Um, so anyway, he went over to Germany for a year, uh, came back, and the, he had to get an internship, the second part of that. He did, he got an internship in a robotics company and um, went back, worked for them another year, um, came home for a summer, and then ended up in the UK working for the same robotics company. And to be, make a long story short, that was a lot of years ago, he is now vice president of that company in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And just loving it and having a great time. Um, he has seen a lot of the world, a lot of the, a lot of the US since he's been back here. And they have never ever, um, you know, brought back saying, well, you only have a two-year degree. You know, it's never been an issue for them. It's always been you have the skills, you had the hands-on. In fact, the first few years when he was over in, the, in Europe, 
the big thing that they kept coming back with is we can't believe you only have a two-year degree because of all of the different areas they try to cover in those two years really helped him have the background they needed in a lot of different areas. So it was really a benefit for him and for the company. So um, he's still in robotics, doing awesome, and really enjoying it. My second son um, didn't want to go to school. <laughs> it was a little bit more of a challenge. He, you know, didn't really care for high school, and we didn't really give him that option. It was like you have to do something. So, um, in school though, in high school, he was involved with like High Mileage Club, which is high schools again working with Fox Valley Tech. He was involved with Mini Chopper, which was high schools involved with Fox Valley Tech programs, and those two things got him thinking like, well, I really know what because they came here and worked in their shops and worked with their, um, their equipment, got to know some of the instructors, and he decided, you know what, I will. I'll come here, give it a try, see what it is. And he ended up um, getting his mechanical engineering degree and decided, you know what, that maybe that isn't what I want to do. So he um, got a second degree from Flakeshore Tech, and then he needed another class or two, so he ended up with his electrical engineering degree. So he's got three technical degrees. Um, but again, he's doing awesome. He is um, working for a company as an electrical engineer. He is looking into going back for his bachelor's, but knows that he has the degree, the, the classes he needs, that he can start as like a junior for his bachelor's. And he's looked into a lot of that already to try to go back and, and um, make that decision. So um, it's just a little harder right now because now he's married and he's got a few other things going on um, like, than, like that instead of doing it right away. But he, again, got his first position out of school based on the fact that he had that background in electrical and mechanical. So he didn't have his bachelor's, but the company that he was with was very happy with the skills he had. And he's got a lot of friends he still sees every day and you know, a, a, lot, a lot from um, people that he met here through the college and things that they've done. So they both have become very, very um, well-rounded young men. Very proud of them. So All that's right. our story. <laughs> Rose, Liz. Thanks. Well, um, my oldest had dual credit courses that she took in um, high school. So she was familiar that way with the tech. But um, my husband and I are both graduate, graduates of the tech. And my kids, or I should say our kids, just kind of grew up here with going to college to, um, camp in the summer as well as take your kids to work day. Um, so I think it was just kind of always in the back of her mind. But when you look at your child and you want the best for them, but still kind of just give them the opportunity to say, well, this is what I want to do, um, you just, I just knew her personality. And um, a few years ago, I sat in on um, the advisory committee for professional communications. And with everything that they would talk about, I just knew that this is something that she would like. So I picked up brochures and took home some information. And she said, hey, I want to check this out. Um, so she did. She chose professional communications. She's in her second year. She'll graduate in May. Um, but we, we did come to the conclusion a few different ways. Um, and I think a lot of it, though, my husband will say, <laughs> Um, he's a graduate of the printing program, as I, as I am as well. But um, we just knew her personality, and it was just an easy transition for her to come here. Um, but yeah, we looked at finances. We looked at the ease of commute. Um, she's the oldest of six, so we knew that the day she didn't have class, because um, she has quite a few online classes right now, she'd be able to stay home and watch her four-year-old brother for us, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, we just looked at that as like a win-win all the way around. Um, but we knew too that in two years, she'd have a skill. And if she wanted to go on to a four-year, um, her ultimate goal is to get into concept art and writing and editing for a video design company. Um, she can eventually do that. But she'll have a skill and a trade and be able to pay her way um, to be able to do that. So. But she has liked the easy transition from high school right into tech. Um, she said it's kind of like you already have your foot in the door. She's, she just started her internship program today. Um, so that'll help her build her portfolio and, and give her experience. Um, 
but she said that the neatest part about being here is that it's independent, but yet she's not afraid to ask for help if she needs it. So that's about it. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. So Dory, you're not a teacher here. You didn't go to school here. No. Nope. So you can no. tell us about Dan. Okay. I have three sons, two, um, Reese and Ricky, who did what we just expected to have happen when they graduated from high school. They went on to a four-year college and graduated from it. One is um, using his degree, one is not, and both have debt. Our youngest son, who um, wasn't as thrilled about school and wasn't so into high school, after he graduated, barely graduated, <laughs> He um, took a year off and was not interested in spending more time in school. Um, we really pushed, knew that that was the right thing for him to do, and he, he got that idea too after he was out for about a year. So we really encouraged and pushed, and he went to Madison, to the technical college there, and it failed terribly. Um, he came back home, and he was kind of figuring out what can I do well, Patty happened to be part of our social group, we, or our, our work group, we, um, and she was talking to Danny about Fox Valley Tech and found out that Danny was interested in golfing. And so she encouraged him to come because Fox Valley Tech had a new certification for taking care of the greens at golf courses, and that pulled Danny here. Um, once he was here and started taking classes and the staff and faculty here really pulled him in and made him feel like he was something and could go somewhere. Um, he got really into school and ended up graduating with a horticultural degree, is now working for a company here in the Fox Valley taking care of trees. He's in tree health. He just got a promotion in that company and is doing very well, and I'm thrilled to death that Fox Valley Tech was here and could take his ideas and his passions and help guide him to where he is now. I need to mention that the kid who didn't want anything to do with school was on the dean's list every semester here. <laughs> so you find your place, you find your place. Yeah. You know? um, so Rita, as a professional helping and watching kids make the decisions and families, what do you see as being crucial to that decision-making process? Well, we, we really talk about multiple pathways to prosperity. We know that there are only 28% of all the jobs out there require a bachelor's degree. So if everybody goes on to get a four-year degree, we know that there aren't enough jobs for them. We also know that half of those kids that go on to a four-year college end up leaving after the first year. And then half of those kids, once they graduate, end up getting jobs within their degree. So that's 25% of those students. And when we look at college debt and how much it costs, we know that we as educators really need to talk to our students about what is your passion, what do you like to do, what's realistic. When we do a senior survey in Appleton, over 50% of our students say their biggest fear is student debt. So when you talk about what you did for, for your son um, and the other stories that I hear, that's, that's a big concern for kids. When you start out and you're in the hole already, not that that's a bad thing, because you know there's that value of money, time and money too, that's really important, but we know that our students need to experience things so they know what they want to do. Like, I think the worst question we can ask, like, what if I asked you, what do you want to do? Like, how do you know, right? So we try to say, what have you tried? What do you like? What are some experiences you think might fit your interests and abilities? And until you really understand that, it's, it's hard to know what that career might be for you. So just coming here and taking advantage of this is a great opportunity. In schools, all the Valley schools offer so many things for students now in ways that they can experience different types of careers that are out there. Okay, I will pause and see if there's any questions from any of you that will help guide. You've kind of heard the stories a little bit. What can we help you with in your process? Mm -hmm. Logic is here for students. Where is it located yep. and how many students? Um, so it's called Tech Village, privately owned, privately managed, as I mentioned. It's right across the street. So we, the college has the Bordini Center. It's right next to the Bordini Center. So literally a block away. 
Um, you'll notice, so parents like this, um, there are lighted blinking things when you cross Blue Mound, because honestly that was one of our really big concerns is crossing Blue Mound to come over here. They do have to cross, but we had the city install safety features. Um, so right now there's about 180 students in that, in that uh, facility. It holds, uh, the capacity is 275, and I believe they have 10 resident assistants, so there um, is four stories. Each suite is five um, students can live in there, so there are a combination of single and double bedrooms, and then um, kitchen facilities, dining, dining area, um, living room, so they're very nice. Two bathrooms um, with the suites. So they're doing tours here tonight, and if, you have, if you're interested in at least seeing it, if you go down the hallway, about halfway down the hallway on the right as you're heading back out um, is the table with Tech Village and they can set you up to take a tour over there. Or you can just drive over there and see it. Yeah, it's very cool. What other questions? Mm -hmm. So you're looking for work experience, and I bet several of the parents or um, can answer that question. What kinds of, it's probably different for every program, but I think it's a perfect question. What types of work experience did your son or daughter have when he or she, or currently here at school? Um, I can tell you that both of my sons had internships. Um, and from my previous position internships, I was actually the internship coordinator for the computer sciences area. And companies are always calling the college looking for interns. Um, and we have awesome internship programs. Um, our board and a lot of the deans and instructors are involved with other um, groups, um, things like that. That So their, their network is very um, wide and includes a lot of different people from different companies. So. The co there, that makes other people in the companies aware of what's available and what kind of programs we have, what our students' abilities are, and then the word just kind of gets out. It's like, you know, if you need an intern, you should really contact Fox Valley Tech. So um, both of my sons the second year had internships with companies doing exactly what they were coming to school for. And it wasn't an internship where, oh, you know, <clears throat> we just need somebody to do, do this busy work. It was internship right on the job, learning what they were going to school for. So there's a lot of those possibilities. Tony? Yeah, my, my son, um, he's, it'll be next semester, he'll be, he'll have an internship. Um, he's hoping to get it with Appleton Fire Department. Um, last year, second semester in his EMT class, it was a requirement for the class for him to do, um, I don't remember exactly how many hours now, uh, to go out with paramedics and do ride along and he would respond um, as a, a support person in medical calls that they were making. So um, those are the two now, the paramedic program, Today, I, you're going to test me. I can't tell you exactly what, and if someone knows here, they can chime in in terms of um, work experience he will get in that program, but I'm certain that he will. I'm just not sure exactly what the, what the opportunities are now. So for him, within both programs, he'll have essentially three different work experiences as part of the programming that he'll, he'll be a part of. Liz, how about your daughter? Um. Oh, she just, I said before, she just started her uh, internship today, and oh, yeah. I heard um, that it was a great experience right off the bat, just a couple hours a week, um, but she was already able to tell them a few things that they didn't even realize that they needed for their video editing, <laughs> so um, she is going to love it, and she'll thrive in it, um, but I'm excited because she'll be able to build her portfolio with the experience, so... Did you say where her internship is at? Um, right down the street at uh, UW um, Extension. Oh, okay. Yeah. Dory, I don't remember if Danny had a work experience or not. He, he did, did. A, um, a work study here, okay. and so he worked pretty much there. But what I saw and what I'm still seeing through his time here, there's a pretty strong connection between Fox Valley Tech and businesses in, the, in our community. And Fox Valley Tech has a very good reputation for graduates being very well skilled. Um, as when he 
was in the program, there were different companies that came in and did um, PowerPoints and lectures, or what, they probably don't do PowerPoints anymore, but, um, and through that, we, he met people. And we still are working with some of the people that he met, some of the different companies, and we're learning about entrepreneurs in the landscaping and other businesses that now he's connected to that are growing. So I think in that way, businesses are looking for good employees right now. So businesses will be looking at Fox Valley Tech for their students coming out with the skills that they need. So there's a very strong connection, so. Those are great questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Did anybody here have, uh, I know I Anthony's still in school, but right. how often does an internship turn into an actual job? Uh -huh. I could make an estimate yeah. based on what I hear. I would guess probably half of the time. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, so there's a two-way decision being made there. The employer is getting a chance to see the student, and the student's getting a chance to try out whether or not that kind of employment is what's right for him or her. So, yeah. you know, it isn't necessarily because it doesn't work out. Not all of them are designed to be a hire at the end, but a lot of them are. So if I'm an employer nowadays and I get a really great student working as an intern, I'm going to figure out how to hire that person. I've even heard of some students working the internship for a year after graduation. Mm -hmm. They continue their internship, and then after that year, the company decides whether or not to bring them on yep. if there is a position. Um, some, but like you said, sometimes the companies are like, no, we only, we only have internship positions. If you want a full-time position, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Mm -hmm. If I might, I think I think a related question, which is something that I've always been very impressed um, with the college, is the placement rate of students. So even if it's not connected to an internship in particular, um, so the, enti the entire college has a placement rate of 94%, so I was remembering correctly, but there is something like 40 to 60 programs that actually have 100% placement rate. Show me a place that has better odds. It doesn't get any better than that. So whether there's an internship or not, um, that connection that the college has with businesses, the strong relationship, um, there's advisory committees. You walk through the college, you see it everywhere. Um, it's alive and well, and it shows in those placement rates. If I, if I could just say um, another word on the advisory committee. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's actually each program has an advisory committee, and that's industry people that come in um, twice a year and meet and discuss their needs, what they're seeing, what, what they would like to be taught in the classrooms. Um, and like Lab Science, for example, I know they have um, a required internship, and those... Um, those employers um, are actually paying for these students to come and work, um, and they're also getting their internship need met. Um, but they are hiring those lab science students um, because they've worked for them, so. And some programs require internships and others do not, so depending upon which program you're in, that would be a good question to ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions we can answer for you I do have one more thing to share that we might have some experience. You had asked about the student experience here at the college, and uh, the housing is one aspect of that. But I also want to mention that we have about 50 different student clubs and organizations. And I would say probably 80% of them are um, connected with the program area. So we have a horticulture club. We have um, um, clubs w about with all of the different program areas. And so that's just another way for students to get to know each other professionally and also connect with employers. We have employers coming to the club meetings and doing presentations. We have employers that connect with students in, through club activities. So a very, very vibrant uh, set of choices as far as student organizations are concerned, student government. So I don't know if any of you have experience, um, any of your kids have experience with the student clubs and organizations at all. My son was in the AMS club, well, my oldest one, and um, I was a, um, an advisor for our AITP club, 
And um, another um, area of the college, I don't want to completely um, change the question, the uh, direction here, but the Student Employment Services Office, um, they're also another very good um, resource for students. They bring in, um, they do like on, on campus job fairs. So again, for getting those jobs, they bring the employers in. Um, so, and uh, my youngest son was not a member of any of the um, clubs, but he um, was involved with uh, some of the basketball players and those, those people, so he got to, you know, get in on part of that. So I'll just say as, a, as an educator, the two words that I keep hearing tonight over and over again are connections and experiences. So when you're making connections with those employers, whether that is an internship or just an opportunity within your class or a short little project you might work on, that's a connection that you'll be able to take with you and something you can foster. Doesn't always have to be a full-blown internship like you were saying as well. And any experiences you can gain while you're in high school or while you're at the college are gonna help your students as well. And even parents, connecting with parents, like other parents that, that have been here, like this is a great opportunity for you to be able to ask those questions. I was a parent as well, and you have that fear when your son or daughter goes off, are they gonna be happy? Are they gonna be successful? Are they gonna like what they do? And you never know until you try, right? But really having that opportunity to try some of those things before you make that commitment while you're in school. Those of you that are still in high school, you've got a long time yet. We've got a whole year, if you, even if you're a senior, to try out some of those experiences before you decide what it is that might really click and make it for me. I would say um, my son, though, he's not involved from a, the college experience in, in a formal way. He's got a lot on his plate. Um, but he's had a nice informal network of students, of peers that he's connected with. So in a couple of ways. One is they are, there's a group that's a study group essentially that they, they study together. They've um, been a support to one another in their, in their skill building, if you will, uh, because there's the, the, his role is quite physical too, so they help each other that way. And then they, um, because the career he's getting in requires some fitness um, that's part of what they do they're in a, uh, a group there they work out together and they do it either at the college or they've done it at each other's home so he's just like I did when I was in college I worked out with folks and and I had study groups same thing here any uh, last questions for the panel and I think we'll stick around for a little bit. So if you're not comfortable asking a question, if you want to talk to them one-on-one, um, -on -one, you can come on up and do that or ask us any questions that you like. Really appreciate you coming and hope we gave you some um, tidbits that you can use as you're making your choices. So thank you. Good luck. Yeah. Have a nice day.